Good evening, dear friends. On the occasion of the Lubavitcher Rebbe's anniversary, uh, this is the 92nd anniversary. This would be the 92nd anniversary of the Lubavitcher Rebbe, Rabbi Menachem Mendel Schneerson, with his Rebbetzin, Chaim Mushka Schneerson. So it's a great occasion to bolster the Shalom bias, the peace at home in the community of Cleveland and in all the communities around the world. For this job, and it's a great big job, we are so excited to have my dear friend and former classmate, currently the Chabad representative in Montreal, Canada, one of the Chabad representatives in Montreal, Canada, whom the Canadian press has dubbed Le Rabin du Lamour, which means in English, the love rabbi because of his success in bringing together Jewish couples and training people to focus on the right things and to find their bashert in a very efficient and successful manner. I just read from the biography a little bit to let you know who we're dealing with. At this point, Rabbi Bernath has 61 matches personally. In 2012, he founded the smashing success J Matchmaking International, a network of Jewish dating sites. In 2017, he starred in the hit Canadian broadcasting company documentary, Kosher Love, which was nominated for a Canadian Screen Award and for an Emmy, I think. Is that correct? For an Oscar, yeah. For an Oscar. I got the wrong, uh, I got the wrong, um, for the Oscar. Rabbi Bernath is also a legend on social media, boasting tens of thousands of dedicated followers. Rabbi Bernath posts amazing insights on both love and marriage and Judaism as a whole. He also hosts frequent Facebook and Instagram lives where he provides advice that goes to the core of your relationship questions. Beyond that, uh, Rabbi Bernath is by all definitions an innovative and versatile media mogul. As a professional voiceover artist and storyteller, he has lent his voice to hundreds of productions and performed all over the world. A screenwriter, Rabbi Bernath co-wrote the award-winning feature animation, Young Abraham, which we play at Ganizia Beachwood each and every year. <clears throat> I forgot to send you royalties. I apologize for that. <laughs> As an actor, he performed in The Will and in Mixed Blessings. His other credits include work with Shazak Incorporated, Sandy Productions, CMJ Production, Big Bang Animation, and Real-Time Jewish Media. In 2016, Rabbi Bernath starred in Viceland's popular show, Dead Set on Life. Dead Set on Life, where he lovingly showed chef Maddie Matheson around as they navigated the exciting world of kosher Montreal. Rabbi Bernath is also a frequent guest on CTV's Your Morning, Breakfast TV Montreal, and Global News Montreal. The bottom line is that Rabbi Yisrael Bernath has worked out to a science Torah's approach to love and marriage and relationships in general. And he has even figured out how to say it in clear and concise English. And that's why it's such a thrill to have Rabbi Yisrael Bernath here with us to share with us the Torah's wisdom and his own experiences. And now I give you, ladies and gentlemen, Le Rabin du Lamor, Rabbi Yisrael Bernath. Wow, what an introduction. First of all, it's really special to be here. Um, my old uh, study partner, yeshiva mate, Rabbi Friedman, and uh, to be able to be here is very, very special. Uh, there's a lot of other reasons why it's very special to be here, but I'll leave it at, uh, at that for now. Um, this is a little different than what I'm used to. So it would be great for you to work with me. I'm not used to just kind of doing this monologue thing Rabbi Friedman said, that's what in Cleveland, they like the monologue. They just want to hear what you have to say. Well, for me, I like to kind of transcend the, the screen. So um, I'm going to do, as I've been told, I'm going to do the official speech kind of thing, the lecture. I'm sorry, I'm not at a podium and I don't have any fancy backgrounds behind me, but we'll have to go with that. Um, the, the topic for tonight's talk was... 10 tips for uh, marriage, which sounds really great if it's BuzzFeed, and it sounds really great if it's like one of these clickbaity things, but no, one, no one's clickbaiting right now. So um, I don't think 
there's really any 10 things that can help every single relationship. And I know, I don't know you all, but I know that a lot of you are coming tonight from very different places. And I wanna honor and respect that. And relationships are so diverse. There are so many different kinds of relationships. And because there are so many different kinds of relationships, it's hard to give you 10 pieces of advice that are gonna be great for everyone. So I think I'm gonna kinda weave my way around. I'd like you to use our chat to um, ask questions because Rabbi Friedman has muted you. Um, please use the chat to ask questions. I will be looking at it as I'm talking. So I will integrate your questions right into my talk. Um, you're also, I guess afterwards, hopefully we'll have a little bit of some time for questions and answers if you wanted to unmute yourself. And so with that, I'm gonna start my spiel. So some of the relationships that we have are based on unconditional love, or at least perhaps they should be. According to the Torah, the Pirke Avot, or ethics of our fathers, calls it, and I'm going to use Hebrew words. I don't like using Hebrew words, so for those of you who are unfamiliar with Hebrew, don't worry about it because I will make sure that every Hebrew word I use is properly translated for you so that you don't throw you off. I know that sometimes if someone uses a, another language in a talk, it will throw you off. I'm gonna make sure not to do that. So I'm very conscious of that for those of you who don't know Hebrew. So the ethics of our fathers calls this in Hebrew, ahava she'ena teluya bedavar, which means a love that is not dependent on anything. So there's your family and each relationship there within your family structure is different. You need to honor and respect your parents according to commandment number five in the top 10. You need to love or be a giver or receiver with your spouse, raise your children, give them a good education. Try not to be a rival with your siblings. And if you take a look at the Torah, there are many stories. I mean, you can just look at this week's Parsha, <laughs> this Torah portion, I mean, and last week and, and the week before, and you'll get a great family story in various types of relationships, good, bad, and ugly. One of the things I love about the Torah is it's filled with the good, the bad, and definitely the ugly. And then there is what we call the extended family, the Jewish people the tribe. The Torah wants us to love each other unconditionally as well. We call that Ahavat Yisrael, love of the tribe, love of the Jewish people. And I would say as far as mitzvahs go, as far as commandments go in the good book, I would say that's probably the hardest. Love someone like I love myself, that's a, a very profound, very, very difficult love. Now, another category. So our first category is unconditional love. The second category would be conditional love. What the Torah calls ahava shetuluya bedavar. Like that is love that is conditional. So that would be like a working relationship, a coworker, a boss, your neighbors, maybe even the government, not getting political here. So, you're obligated to love any of these people. Sorry, according to the Torah, you would not be obligated to love any of these people, but you're obligated to get along with them. The Torah calls this darfei shalom, the way of peace. You are obligated, according to the Torah, to be peaceful with them. So now, what are all these relationships? The relationships that are unconditional and the relationships that are conditional, what do they have in common? What do they all need to improve? If I could think of one thing, maybe I'll throw it out to you. Use your chat. What do you think is one thing that every single relationship needs to improve? No matter if it's a, an unconditional love or a conditional love. You can use your chat box. Just give me a word. I see honesty.
If you want, you can also private message it to me if you don't want it to be, because if you don't want everyone to see it, there's also the option to private chat it and I'll make sure that you stay anonymous. I see listening before answering. Desire. Thank you for those who are private messaging. I appreciate that and I understand your, your uh, anonymity. I said that correct. Desire for a relationship, trust. Fantastic. So I want you to patience and tolerance, kindness. If we go take a look at honesty or we take a look at listening before answering or we take a look at desire, we take a look at trust, patience, tolerance, kindness, take a look at all these things. They actually all do have one thing in common. And I think this is the one thing that every relationship needs to work on. And that is conflict. Every single relationship has or could have some kind of conflict. What do you think of when I say the word conflict? What is the first word that comes to your mind? Put it in the, in the chat box for a second. What, did, what Does it give you good feelings? Does it give you bad feelings? Does it make you uncomfortable? Do you embrace conflict? What does conflict say? I see fear, disagreement, arguing. resentments. So difference. Conflict, conflict is, is exactly how it feels. The word conflict, it has this emotional connotation to it. It's almost scary or, or who, who wants to go there? Well, why do we want to mess up a good thing? Why do we want conflict? I mean, relationship is supposed to be happily ever after. It's supposed to be beautiful. It's supposed to be romantic and exciting. Why conflict? And I think if there's one thing that I could start off tonight with, that would be our society has conditioned us to think that conflict is bad. I would like to ask you for a favor. I like to, you to put that aside for a moment. I'm not saying forever, just for the next 30 minutes. Because I like, if we're gonna start tonight's talk with the preconditioning that conflict is bad, well, then we can't get started here. We can't even talk. We have to talk as conflict, as a necessary component of a relationship. I don't think you have to agree with me right now, but just at least allow me to to talk about it in a way that you don't have your arms folded like this in front of you, like, okay, what does this rabbi have to say? Like, what's going on here? But actually to really think about some of the things that I'm going to say and to, to, to let them land. And you can also challenge them and you can challenge me. I'm, I'm, I'm here, we're not going anywhere. You can, you can allow them, you can allow them in, allow them to land and then challenge them. So. What I'm gonna do is use a very important thing. I'm gonna say the thing, I'm gonna say it. it may, you may not agree with it. I'm gonna ask you to let it land. And then you can also question it and challenge it. You can question it anonymously by using the direct message but, uh, button for me, or you can um, challenge them publicly using the chat box. Judaism teaches that conflict is how we learn. Conflict is how we grow. Conflict is collective thinking. It just depends most of the time on how we manage it. You know, a movie, a good movie has three parts. It has the setup, the conflict, and the resolution. Would you watch a movie without a conflict? I mean, just think about it a second. You know, there was a great movie about how everything was just amazing and it just got better and better and better. You would get so fed up with it. You'd be like, okay, like enough with your perfect life already. I've had enough of this. I don't need any more of your perfect. I want some conflict, give me the struggle. So when we watch the movies, when we listen to a story, we're waiting for the conflict. So why would you think that our real life would be any different? Now, in the Jewish tradition, there are two Talmuds. 
there are there's the Jerusalem Talmud and there's the Babylonian Talmud. Today, we study and we depend mostly on the Babylonian Talmud. Why? Because there's more conflict in it. Because in the Babylonian Talmud, everyone is always disagreeing. The Jerusalem Talmud is just too serene. It's not interesting. I mean, it's, it's, it's interesting on a factual level, but not interesting on a, I mean, if you go look in the Babylonian Talmud, this rabbi is arguing with this rabbi and there's fights and, and you walk into a yeshiva. If you walked into the yeshiva where, where Rabbi Friedman and I were studying, I don't know, 20 some odd years ago, it's hard to believe it now. You would see we were sitting there debating across the table from each other because that is the nature of study. That's the nature of learning is conflict. So I like to challenge my own idea right now. I want to ask a question. The question is, and it's not a, it's not a leading question. It's an open-ended question. The question is, why is conflict so healthy in a relationship? And if you want, you can try to think about it, let it land. So someone says, I hate my brother in a strong sense. That's my conflict. Thank you. I, I really, first of all, I appreciate you sharing that and being so open to be able to share that with me. And obviously I keep that anonymous. Um, yeah, I, 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 I want you to think about that. How is conflict so healthy in a relationship? So someone else says it allows expansion. It instigates chance for growth. I love that. Instigates chance for growth. Someone else says, because it can lead to growth. Someone else says, we are a whole people. That's right. We are a unidimensional person. We are three-dimensional. So of course, there's going to be a part of ourselves that's even in conflict with ourselves. So it's healthy. At least this is my opinion at this moment, and I'm happy to change it if, if, you, if you can convince me something different. But it's healthy because in human nature, every strength that a person has also contains a weakness. And every weakness also contains a strength. Think about it a second. Every strength that a person has also contains a weakness and every weakness also contains a strength. For example, someone who's really neat, someone who's really organized, someone who's really on time, those are considered to be really good traits, but they also imply a weakness. Can this person be flexible? Can they let go and have fun? Tell me, someone who is really neat and really organized and really on time, do you wanna go on vacation with them? I mean, yeah, maybe if you wanna see the Grand Canyon, Mount Rushmore, a Broadway show, all in the same day with minute by minute precision, then you go on a vacation with that person. Oh my gosh, how relaxing. So the interesting thing for our super organized hypothetical person is, what happens when this super organized hypothetical person has to deal with someone who's different? Someone who's different than them at home or at school or at work or anywhere. Can they handle that kind of change? Someone who doesn't like it just the way they like it? Someone who, who is not as neat as them? So the first thing that we have to understand in this process is you need them and they need you. They need you to teach them to be a little more organized, but you need them to learn how to be more flexible. They need you to teach them to be a little more organized and you need them to teach you how to be a little more flexible because they're both so important in a holistic life. Different situations in our lives require both. So what happens when your boss or your professor will leave something a little bit up in the air? What do you mean? You're gonna freak out because you couldn't deal with it in advance. 
or you'll be able to wing it because sometimes you just have to wing it. I mean, look at me right now. I'm just having a good time and I'm winging it, right? Sometimes that's great. Sometimes it's gotta be real. It's gotta be authentic. It's gotta come from your heart. It can't all be pre-planned and pre-organized. I'm not one of those neat and tidy organized type people. So people, people are complicated. We are all so complicated. And they're, because we're all so complicated, besides one of you over there, one of you aren't complicated for sure, but the rest of us, we're all complicated. There are so many different types of conflicts. We all think that our conflicts are unique, that nobody else is going through this in their life. I mean, me and my husband, me and my wife, oh, we're so different. We're always arguing about it. Wouldn't you believe it? We're always arguing. So I'm always amazed with the couples that I see, with the singles that I see in council, how many situations are not unique, how similar we really all are. And a lot of the situations that we're going through and a lot of the struggles that we go through are so similar. There are actually five issues that people in every type of relationship tend to get into long-term conflict about. And so these are gonna, they're really 10, but I'm gonna use them as five. And these are what we're gonna call your BuzzFeed 10 or your BuzzFeed five for tonight. So it all began, I'll give you the background behind this so you know that it's not coming from my head. Um, in 1919, there was a young American psychologist, you may have heard of him before, his name was Gordon Alport. And he decided that he was gonna visit the great Sigmund Freud. And he finally arrives at Sigmund Freud's office and he's telling Freud about his journey. And he said on the train, there was this little boy who was sitting across from him who was obsessed with staying clean. And he had a little rag and he was wiping down the chairs and he didn't want to sit next to anyone and he didn't want to touch anything. And this, this Gordon Alport, he wondered if the boy's mother had some kind of dirt phobia and that it rubbed off on this young boy. And so he's telling this whole tale to Freud. And at the end of it, Freud looks at him and I'm not going to try to do a Freud voice. Maybe Rabbi Friedman has a good Freud voice. He, he likes to do imitations, or at least he used to. And Freud looks at him and he says, that little boy you saw, remember the inner child, that Freudian inner child, that was actually you. Basically like, it wasn't some kid on the train and you're making this and, and, and Alport's like, well, you're making this into some kind of big unconscious episode from my repressed childhood. Alport actually thought at this moment that Freud was digging a little too deep. And sometimes you don't have to look that deep. He, he actually was, was not in agreement with Freud. And he said that with behavior, he described personality in terms of what he called fundamental traits or characteristics or conscious motives. And he wasn't so much interested in explaining traits as he was in describing the, the modern trait. What, what is the actual characteristic of an individual? This was developed a number of times, most recently by two famous psychologists named Robert McRae and I believe Paul Costa. Don't quote me on it, I'm just doing this from memory. And they organized these Alport's fundamental traits into what they call the big five. You may have heard of the big five before. So these are five big personality factors. And today they're very well known in modern psychology. There's a lot of um, psychoanalysts that are using these big five traits and they've been demonstrated on this rating scale. Now I'm gonna to try to describe them to you because I think that it's important to kind of understand this and perhaps it's going to 
open up or allow you to peer into a different part of yourself and a different part of your relationship or your future relationship that you weren't able to or you won't be able to. So when a person is very low on one measure, someone else, probably the person they're going to be in a relationship is going to be high because these 10 or five personality traits are with regards to conflict. They are actually, if one person is going to be on one extreme, the other person will be the other extreme, and the conflict lies in the middle. So if you wonder why we're always fighting about such and such a thing, well, you're going to find out in a second why. Most conflicts in relationships will boil down to these five things. So they are the following. You, um, I, I remember them by canoe or by ocean. I like mnemonics. That's how I remember things in general. So I'm gonna use canoe. They are conscientiousness, C, conscientiousness, A, agreeableness, N, neuroticism, O, open to experience, and E, extroversion. So that is canoe or ocean, depending on which way you wanna, you wanna, you wanna put them. Again, conscientiousness, agreeableness, Neuroticism, open to experience, and extrovert and, and, and extroversion. I'm going to do something for you here. Uh, for those of you who want to take a look at it, I just put it into your chat box. So we might, you can always remember it by canoe. So let's get started with conscientiousness. Conscientiousness has an opposite extreme. Can anyone, I'm not going to ask you what it is but I'm gonna tell you. The opposite extreme to conscientiousness, and you can look at your chat, I'm gonna be putting these in your chat also, so you can kind of look at your chat, it'll be kind of like our whiteboard through this process. The opposite is lack of direction. So conscientiousness means someone who's organized, someone who is on time, someone who is self-disciplined, like that hypothetical person that we spoke about that no one knows. Um, the scientists call the opposite of that person a lack of direction. Like, as in, you know, that boy, he lacks direction. It's kind of judgy. And, and actually, I didn't make up these things. These are scientific terms. But, and, and, and I'm, we're not saying that one is better than the other, but it just happens to be, these are two opposite traits. If you had to look at a scale, these would be one side would be conscientiousness and the other side would be lack of direction. So someone who's agreeable is someone who always agrees. Someone who, um, gets along with people, someone who's diplomatic, someone who's polite. The opposite of agreeable, so, agree, so we have number two, which is agreeable. The opposite is antagonistic. I'm just writing it here for you. The opposite of agreeable is antagonistic or disagreeable, someone who always disagrees. Someone who's blunt. Maybe uh, they're a bit of a curmudgeon. I love that word, curmudgeon. So descriptive, a descriptive word. No, well, I guess if they're a curmudgeon, they can't be too tall, right? It's like a certain, I don't know. I'm joking, joking, all these stereotypes. I hate stereotypes, but we always use them. Then we have the neurotic, and yeah. I know, I'm thinking about this. Whenever, when I first saw this, I'm like, these researchers are bad. They went after our mothers. How could they? Neurotic, unbelievable. They went after our poor Jewish mothers. I mean, that wasn't right. Neuroticism is how emotional somebody is. It's this emotional stability versus instability. Could, it could be anxiety. It could be anger, depression. It could be impulsiveness, thick skin, lack of self-confidence. The opposite of neurotic is stability. That's the opposite. So we have conscientious, conscientiousness versus lack of direction. We have agreeableness versus antagonistic, and we have neurotic versus stability. And then we have, this is an interesting one. This is one I, 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 it, I, I, never, I never thought about it until I went through this. There's openness to experience. 
verse closed to experience. So there are people who are open to new experiences. They're always excited. Okay, let's go somewhere new. Let's, uh, let's try something else, a hobby, an interest. And there are people who, they have to go to the same store at the same time, and they always buy the same thing. They always go to the same restaurant. The restaurants are open in, in Cleveland. I don't know if they're open in Montreal, they're not. They always go to the same restaurant and they don't try anything new. Oh, no, 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 no. They must order the same thing in the same way. And don't forget to get the early bird special. As we say in, as we say in French, très important. Early bird special, very important. So the person who's open to new experiences loves new things. They're all excited. Yeah, let's try a new place. Oh, wow, did you see that there was a price mistake on uh, one of the things and there's a $30 ticket to Iceland? Let's go. And the other one's like, hold on a second. Where are we gonna stay? What are we gonna eat for dinner when we get back? Yes, that's what a close to experience is worried about. He's not worried about the trip. He's worried about what we're eating for dinner when we get back. Nobody can relate to that, I'm sure. And finally, I left the easiest one for last. The opposite of extrovert is, you know, introvert. And generally, you're going to find, especially in a relationship, especially in a romantic relationship, that one will be more extroverted and the other one will be more introverted. Now, again, we don't work at extremes. We're looking at a, a continuum. But you will find on a continuum, and I actually created a questionnaire that I can send you that actually will help you and your partner understand where you fit in this. So it goes from zero to 40. So zero would be one side of the continuum and 40 would be the other. And you can see where you land, but you'll find more often than not, one partner will be on one side of the continuum and the other one will be on the other because that is the holistic life that we seek. And often we do this without even knowing it. What we have here, and what I, why I love this so much, is it's just a method to the madness. The madness we know intuitively. If we're already married and we're in a relationship, we probably figured it out intuitively. But now we can start to understand conflict and understand the method to the madness. Now, obviously you probably figured out, I'm a proud extrovert. What is an extrovert? An extrovert is someone who is energized by talking to people. They don't like to be alone. They don't like to face themselves. They're generally quite assertive. And an introvert gets recharged with a good book. If they are coming out to the Zoom afterwards, they just need unwind time. Just give me my alone time, my unwind time. They just have to stare into space because being around people just drains them. It's hard. I need my to just, I need my space. Now, I'm going to read everyone's mind right now. I think probably as I was talking over the past five minutes, you pegged yourself into all these different personality factors. You decided what you are, where you fit in. As I was describing them, right? You were just like, yeah, I mean, I know exactly where I am. I know exactly where my partner is, or I know exactly where my mom is, or where my dad was. So, if I had to say, oh, will all the disagreeable people please raise their hands? I'm joking, because the disagreeable people will, will never raise their hands because they're disagreeable. If I say to the disagreeable person, raise your hand, they're for sure not gonna raise your hand. To a disagreeable person, you say, keep your hand down. Then all of a sudden, all the hands go up. Now, it's hard to be honest about this. But I mean, I could say, can everyone who's married to a disagreeable person please raise their hand? Then maybe I'll get some answers because usually agreeable people are married to disagreeable people. That's just how it goes. Now, what I'm really trying to touch at and what I'm really trying to point out is the words that the scientists have chosen to describe are quite judgmental. Actually, I think that they make us favor one side over the other. I mean, who wants to be labeled disagreeable or, or antagonistic or neurotic? These are, seem to be very um, judgmental words. So in Judaism, in Kabbalah, in Hasidus, we have our own terms to refer to these personality factors. We call them sefirot 
or midot, not factors, but we call them sefirot. So forget about disagreeable or antagonistic for a second. Is anyone here comfortable with identifying as a gavura type? Gavura, meaning like a severity, someone who is more strict or severe. Maybe that's a little better. See, these Jewish terms, they're ancient. And I believe that they convey a lot. Agreeableness generally refers to someone who's chesed, someone who is filled with loving kindness, someone who's able to always see the good in others. And gevura is someone who holds back more, who's judging who they associate with. Now, that isn't always a bad thing because we know that chesed, that loving kindness, has no end. So someone who's always kind is really never kind. And they need someone in their life who has a little bit of gavura, who's like, Dudski, stop, enough of the kindness. You can't give, you know, you, you, I mean, I know you're the kind of guy that will give the shirt off your back, but you need the shirt. I mean, I know you'll give it off. The, I mean, I know everyone say, oh, he's the kind of guy to give the shirt off the back, but then what is he going to do without the shirt? So he needs someone in his life to say, you need to be kind. Wonderful. I, I love that you're kind. It's such a great quality, but sometimes, fini, fini, sometimes. And I am the Gavura person in your life, and I know when is enough is enough. So I think that we need to learn to recognize when someone is different than us in terms of these five factors or these midot, these traits, and appreciate that what they have may be something that could teach us. They may have an ability to teach us. So for example, like I just said, the chesed person, the person who's always kind needs to learn how to say no. Because if you always agree, then you never really agree. And you're not able to be your own person. If there's someone who, let's say, is open to experience, they're probably gonna be a very good leader. For leadership, being open to experience and being flexible in that nature is something that's a very good trait to have. But if we all scored high and open to experience, we'd be in big trouble because nothing would ever get done. We need people who are close to experience in order for stuff to get done. So we can't all be that way. Openness openness to experience in Kabbalah or in Hasidus is what we call Chachma. Chachma doesn't mean wisdom. They often translate it as wisdom. It doesn't mean wisdom. It means intellectual conception. It's a certain kind of ability to create, to be creative, to create new ideas, to create new things. So going back to how we started, with Pirkei Avot, with ethics of our fathers. There's a beautiful line there in the Mishnah. It says, Im en chachma en bina. Im en bina en chachma. Chachma needs bina. What is bina? Bina is that expansion. It's being able to piece things apart. It's focusing on the details. So now I have this intellectual, I'm a visionary. I have this great idea, but all I see is the bigger picture. I see the macro picture. I need someone on my team to be able to see the micro picture. That's the Bina person. Me, the Chachma person, who's the visionary, needs someone on my team to be able to see the Bina. So the person who's closed to new experiences, that's the processor, that's the Bina person. So the open to to new experiences, the, the visionary needs someone who's closed to new experience in order to be the processor. Thank you for those of you who are asking me to translate. If I didn't, if you didn't get it, I will take the time to make sure to translate. So Chachma just means conception. It means that visionary. There's other literal translations to it, but I'm giving you a definition better than translation. It means it's the visionary. It's the person who's open to experience. And Bina is the person who is the, is, um, is the person who is the processor who develops the ideas. So thank you, analytical person. Someone who needs to process, to build. Bina means to 
Actually, Bina literally means to build in Hebrew, someone who was able to build up. So the visionary thinks up the idea, that Chachma, that visionary person thinks up the idea, and the Bina person builds up on it and analyzes it and pieces it apart. Now, openness to experience actually has a bit of a correlation with being politically liberal. And Bina, the processor, has a bit of a correlation with being politically conservative. I'm not going into politics, just thought I'd mention that. So, okay, fine, maybe I'll, I'll talk about it. Some of you want me to talk about it, I'll talk about it. So, um, I've made a lot of mistakes in my life. Some of them I'm proud of, some of them I'm not proud of. I find that social media is a place where you often end up making a lot of mistakes. If you put yourself out there on social media, the odds are you're gonna be making mistakes and it's gonna come back. So, um, I wrote something a while ago that said, uh, having to do with uh, Jerusalem and having to do with the embassy, that Jerusalem was the capital of the Jewish homeland before the US was even a thought. And there's no need to be apologetic or even political about it. And I was, it was having to do with Mr. Trump and, and I, 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 just, I just said this and, I, and I, wasn't, I wasn't saying it in a political way, I was just saying it in a more of a matter of fact way that I don't always, I said, Mr. Trump, I don't always like your antics or your methodology, but the statement that you had made with regards to Israel and your support for Israel is really incredible. And it's just incredible to be able to hear the truth that we hold so near and dear to our hearts, spoken from one of the most prominent podiums in the world. And I finished off my post by saying that I pray that the lovers and the haters only see the good in your words, and that this helps usher in an era of true peace. And obviously I'm a rabbi and I, I, I wasn't trying to get political. I was profoundly moved by a various experience and I did my best. But today, and especially after the election, people are talking about how the political climate is so polarized that literally the, the country is divided in half. Why? And I think that there's a problem, there's, a, there's, there's a, a basic problem and it doesn't only factor into politics, it factors into our lives as well, into our offices, it factors into our homes, it factors into our friendships. We somehow, I don't know when it was, it wasn't that long ago, but sometime we stopped seeing people as people. We stopped seeing each other as people. And we stopped trying to understand why our opponents, and I'm really air quoting that, our opponents are the way they are. And we stopped seeing the merit in what they were saying. We stopped being apolitical. We all created these opinions. Oh, well, life is too short to, to, you know, for, you know, to, to know this and this person. I mean, come on, like, you know, today, what's the first question people ask me when I'm setting them up? Well, what political orientation are they? But that is, does, does that matter, really? I guess it does. Anyway, on my Facebook that day, a 150 plus comment war ensued. I didn't expect that. I didn't get involved because I, I, I didn't think that it was, it, it's, it's not my place, not the place of a rabbi. It doesn't even matter to a certain point. I was just expressing a certain feeling that I had. But what I saw there is that people were just roaring at each other. They were just, they were just, they, they weren't, there wasn't a conversation. There wasn't come to my side of the table, understand who I am. The conflict wasn't a true and real conflict. It was a fake conflict. And when you see a person as a person, then the conflict is not a conflict. And maybe, maybe the other person is wrong, but does it matter? I mean, how about just appreciating the soul for who they are? How about just appreciating the person for who they are? How is it, how, how it's coming from a good place? Not people, people aren't bad. We, God didn't create bad people. Before disagreeing with someone, just remember that they're a soul. There's, a, there's not a, 
a, a politic behind it. There's not a, 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 a robot behind that. There's a real soul, a real person with real thoughts, a true human being. And yeah, God gave us two different personalities because God didn't want this world to be unilateral. God to be to be to be per, you know to be one-sided. God wanted it to be you know, to, to, to be a beautiful, colorful, poetic world. God wanted different perspectives. And I think that today, more and more, we need to take a look at conflict as the message of our generation. The message that conflict is good. The first thing I say to every single couple that comes into my office to get married, thank God being where I am, I get the, the joy of being able to marry a lot of couples. Even through this pandemic, I've been really enjoyed. I've, 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 many couples have moved their marriages, their weddings for a, for a year from now after the pandemic, but many have chosen marriage over wedding. And I always, I, I have this great love for the couples that have chosen marriage over wedding and getting married in the middle of the pandemic. But every couple, especially young couple that comes into my office, I say the same thing to them. My first thing I say to them, fight is good. Rupture is good for relationship. What I'm gonna teach you through the process of our premarital work is gonna be how to repair it. Every couple repairs their relationship differently. And the first thing that a couple has to do is learn how to repair their relationship. Every couple does it differently. And so we need tools. We need to know how to do that, how to repair, how to look at our relationships and how to repair our relationships. It's very hard, especially beginning. You know, I'm dealing with young couples. The beginning of a relationship is really tough, but every couple needs to learn how to repair that relationship. And if they learn how to repair that relationship, that's going to be the secret. That's going to be the glue. And within that, the couple needs to know that they are different and differences are okay. Don't look at the other person as a thing or a politic or an idea or Oh, well, you said this. I could never be in a relationship with someone who says that. No, no, you're a human being. You're holistic. There's more to life than what you said. And, you know, we, and we always say talk is cheap. So is talk really cheap? Is it real? Are we for real or not? The world needs all different types of people. We can't only have rabbis. We can't, we need police officers. We need bakers. We need good husbands and wives. That's what we need. The world needs all types of people. I mean, take a look at neurotic people. I got I to gotta focus on that because I just, I hate that word. And, and I hate that it's focusing too much on our wonderful Jewish mothers as a stigma. I mean, neurotic people are me adult people. They're emotional people. They're emotive. They're, they're sensitive. They're understanding. Okay, fine. A little drama isn't a bad thing. I mean, can you imagine if my talk here right now was monotone? If there was no emotion in my talk? I mean, we could all be sitting here. You ready to go to sleep? It's now bedtime story. And this is what we'll end up doing. But we need the emotion. We need the passion. That passion is so important. And we don't want that, that, that flat effect. People who are less emotional tend to marry people who are more emotional, more neurotic air quotes. Why? Because they want to keep things exciting. That makes sense to me. He needs that excitement. He, and he happens to be very open to new experiences. And what does he want a new challenge? And, and think about it, without neurotic people, we wouldn't have Woody Allen. Come on, seriously. There's so much art, there's so much comedy, there's so much music, there, there's great literature, and that would all be missing from the world. Those are mostly neurotic people. 
without introverts or the people we call antisocial. Let's be honest, we'd probably be stuck in the Stone Age. All the technology that we're using to enjoy this talk right now was made by antisocial people, by introverts. The world would be missing so much. And the joy, look at that, me, the great extrovert, can enjoy having this relationship with all of you right here, right now. I'm in Montreal, you're in Cleveland because of a bunch of antisocial people. I appreciate that. I think it's amazing. How beautiful is that? We have to champion that. We have to, we have to say, yes, we need all types of people. But we also need to get along. We need each other. We really do. We need to find our unique roles and the roles for others in our lives. Our family, our friends, our coworkers, our neighbors. I think that's the magic of the big five. The Kabbalistic big five personality factors. It's an inclusive model. It's a different way of thinking. Back to ethics of our father, and I'm almost done here. I know I see you're already getting a little bit uh, spilkis. Me too, I'm also getting spilkis. If I'm getting spilkis, you're getting spilkis. Getting a little antsy in my chair. Pirkei Avot, the ethics of our father says, Ein adam she'en lo sha'a. There is no person who does not have their time to show their unique ability. Every person has their unique ability. Every person came into this world for a unique purpose. And it's our job as husbands and wives to be the person who helps our partner be able to show their unique ability, be able to rise up to that challenge, to be rise up to their purpose. A few weeks ago, I did a, a couples event here in Montreal where we took a, a test to measure where we came out on the big five factors. And we compared our scores and then we did it over Zoom and we compared the scores of our spouses. It was for couples, for young couples. And what, was, what I was amazed by is the differences predicted really well what the conflicts were. And they also helped us think about and appreciate the good qualities of our spouses and how those good qualities are intertwined with the things that we don't like. So, I mean, I love to, to, to go into this more, just to, just to wrap it up for you. Conscientiousness, agreeableness, neuroticism, open to experience, extroversion. Again, conscientiousness versus lack of direction, Agreeableness versus antagonism, neurotic versus stability, open to experience versus close to experience, and introvert and extrovert. And what I'll do is when I'm, now that we've spoken about it and you have an idea of it, you can ask Rabbi Friedman uh, after this talk, and I will be sending him a little questionnaire that I created that you can do with your partner, and you can kind of see where you fit on that. And if we ever had to come back and talk about it more, you'll have an idea of where we stand. And those were my big five that are really big 10. And though hopefully you're able, you're able to see yourself through that and get a little bit more of an understanding of your relationships through that lens. And that's my spiel, my talk for tonight. Thank you very, very much, Rabbi Yisrael Bernath. Le Rabin du Lamor. And now I'm going to give everybody the opportunity, the ability to unmute your microphones and ask questions. We'll try not to pile on, but we do have a couple minutes for questions. So and you can free. also you can also um, anonymously ask questions by just sending me a direct message. I don't know who you are. So and after this thing is done, all these messages are going to get destroyed. It goes puff into the ether of the internet. So you don't have to worry about it. You can feel free to ask anonymous questions. I have a few anonymous questions that have already come in here. So I'm gonna, I can definitely uh, take a look at uh, that. People for sure were, were saying, were kind of giving me throughout the process, I was getting a lot of, oh, my husband is this, my wife is this, 
my this. Oh yeah, I can see this. I can see what's going on. Well, I definitely encourage you to do the questionnaire together. And I think it'll be a great couples evening. I know that a lot of couples are missing those. If you ever had like couples nights out that you did date nights, um, the, the pandemic has made it more difficult for that. So I think it's really great opportunity taking some of these questionnaires and making a couples night in and having a discussion about your relationship can only help build and make your relationship that much better. Um, I have a question. Here's a, here's, a, here's a question that came in from someone. I feel like I cannot connect with others or myself. And I was wondering if you thought it could be reversed. Well, first of all, I wanna tell you, and this is anonymous question. So anonymous person, I hope you're listening still. Let me just make sure you're still on here. Uh, looks like you're not on here. Okay, well, anonymous person who's not on here. Um, I think that any time that we can call it, say the thing, saying the thing is so powerful. If you can say, I feel like I cannot connect, that is the beginning, that is the opening for being able to be helped. To come into class. <laughs> yeah, it's true. Thank you. You're right. But I think that it's, uh, it, it's, it's the opening for being able to look at yourself and take a look. We're, we're so easy to blame others for our, oh, it's my mother's fault. Oh, it's this person's fault. Oh, it's that. You know the old story about the three mothers talking about their sons, right? The one mother says, my son is so amazing, he bought me a car. The other one says, my son's so amazing, he bought me a house. The other one says, my son's so amazing, he's been going to therapy for 30 years and all he talks about is me. So I think that we're so easy to blame others. And the first thing we have to do is be able to let it land and allow ourselves to say, I am the common denominator in all my failed relationships. I'm the common denominator in all of that, which is difficult for me in my life. And that's hard. It's very hard. But that's the beginning of being real and being authentic with ourselves. I mean, some other time we can talk about you know, the disconnect between the heart and the mind. I see it so often in singles that I speak to today where they feel one thing and they know something else. They know this person, this thing is not right for them or the person is not, but they're attracted to something so different. And having that kind of balance, that authenticity is so powerful. It's so important, it's so real. Um, another question that came in here is one tip that works for all 10 types. Well, if I had one tip that worked for all 10 types and there wouldn't be any value in the 10 types. That's what I'm saying is it would be, I mean, I could give you some stuff that's, I mean, we're gonna generalize and generalizations, generalizing generalizations. I mean, that's a whole new world right there. So, um, but, that, but that's real and that's, and that's important. Um, here's another one here, opposites attract. Is there a danger if your partner is your opposite? How can we work together and grow together? So first of all, attraction means similarity. So opposites being attract, attract, that may be your narrative right now, but it's actually similarities that attract, not opposites. So if you think that you're really opposite, well, maybe it's time that you take a look at your similarities. What do you see in each other? Why did you get into that relationship to begin with? What attracted you to begin with to that person? So I think that when we say opposites attract, it's a beautiful thing. And I know it's a great generalization. It's often not true. As someone who spends a lot of time matching people up, I see a lot of similarities that may look like opposites. Because the fact is, and now think about this, openness to experience and close to experience is not opposite. It's complementary. What you're looking for in someone else is not an opposite. It's a complementary factor. Complementary elements, they are attractive. That's what we're looking for. So it's not that, that the opposite is really the person. It's not really the opposite. It's that, take a look at what is that person? What does that person do for you that you can't do for yourself? How does that person fill a part of you that you aren't able to fill yourself. Um, so 
So this person who messaged me before actually came back. I'm really happy. So I'm going to go back. I, I didn't answer the question before because the person wasn't there, but this person actually just came back on. Um, hopefully you didn't, you, don't, you didn't see who was gone. And you know what? I'm not going to, you know, I, I feel bad. I just unanonymized it. Is it okay? I just, I just messed up your anonymity. So if you message me privately and say, I can answer your question from before, I will. Um, thank you for all your nice compliments, all of you who sent me nice compliments. Um, any other questions? Which are the questions that I have so far? Yeah. Do you feel that it's a, <clears throat> it's a, a good thing when a couple is going out for them to try to figure out how they fit together or whether they should fit together based on some of the things that you that you've said do you use that when you counsel couples so um if a, i i don't i always say i don't make choices for people i just support the choices they make mm -hmm. so i don't think that i you're, you're you're asking. I, I mean, can I can I ask you a question on your question? Yeah, sure. Are you talking about a shidduch? Are you talking about a secular uh, relationship? What what exactly are you referring to? Um. Are you talking about a young couple, an older couple? Yeah, yeah, younger couples. I I see that it's so difficult. If it wasn't hard enough before this situation for young people to get together, to talk to each other, to really find out about each other. Mm -hmm. um, but it's a hundred times worse now. So, you know, how, how do you have a real conversation and find out about the other person so in, what, you know, in I, this time? So what, what I do when I counsel singles, is we have to start off from, from the beginning. Often I find, and I'm generalizing, as you're generalizing, we're all generalizing right now. But so, you know, I don't like to generalize because each person is unique and special and different. And so we have to generalize because there's more than the two of us talking right now. So obviously people will pick up on the elements that are important for them. When, when, when a, a person, is going out. There's, you know, I don't know if you've ever heard of John and Julie Gottman. Doctors John and Julie Gottman, I would say today they are the foremost experts on relationships. Um, the Seven Habits to Make Marriage Work is the only book that I recommend to, I give it to every single one of my young couples. I recommend that you, you buy it. It's good for older marriages, for younger marriages. And these two researchers, they've been researching relationships for, I don't know, some about 30 years. And uh, John Gottman, who actually happens to be a, a, a religious Jew, but that no one knows that. He was a keeper wearing Jew. I know people are always shocked. Uh, spent some time with him. They're amazing people, and they have what they call the Love Lab in Seattle. And he can tell with what he claims 99% accuracy whether a couple is going to make it or break it. And through you know they have incredible data, and I, I can I can talk all night about some of their some of their studies. One of the studies that has always fascinated me is he says that by the time someone is 35, they will have dated four people they could have married. Which, which leads me to believe that there's a lot of people who are dating people, but they don't know what they're looking for. They have a person they could marry in front of them, but they have no idea what they're looking for. So the question, and I'm just skipping because I go through a whole process with the singles, I'm just giving you the result of the process, is the question is, can the person I'm looking for and the person I am who I bring to the relationship, can they be married? Can the person I'm looking for be married to me, the person who I am. Mm -hmm. And it's amazing. I'll give you an example. There was a, a young woman I was talking to this week and she had a broken engagement. And the primary reason for the broken engagement was that he was too controlling. So she decided as a result of that, she doesn't want anyone controlling, but she doesn't want to take control of the relationship. Yeah. So her experience has said, she doesn't want someone controlling, but she doesn't want to take control. So, so there it is. There, I mean, that's just, just a, a classic example of a person that I want and the person that I'm looking for and how they can't be in a relationship together. Mm -hmm. So what I would say to the singles 
is you have to just make sure the person you're looking for and the person you are can be married. Mm-hmm. I know I just said something very complicated, as simple as I could. And I took something that usually takes hours and hours to figure out. And I tried to give it to you in 30 seconds or less, but that's the basic gist of it. Very good, thank you. Yeah. Um, here's another question that just came in. If two people in a relationship share traits, they're highly similar, which is something I, I do see. Are there going to be inherent problems with them down the road? Um, we call it the brother and sister relationship. Some people like that. So if someone is extremely close to new experiences, I would highly advise against marrying someone who's extremely open to experiences because that is just a source of huge conflict. So often they're going to find they're going to marry someone who is who's closer to the close side of experience, which will end up being highly similar traits. I don't think that's a bad thing. I just think that every there's going to be conflict in every relationship. We have to say this over and over again. Conflict is good for relationships. We're not looking for the easy, for less conflict, because what ends up happening is rupture and repair. Rupture needs repair. Rupture creates better relationships. Your relationship will stay static if there's no rupture. If you know how to fight, fight well, not dirty. Fighting dirty is using absolutes. Like you always do this, or you always do that. That's an absolute, that's called, that's what we call fighting dirty. If you're not fighting dirty, but you fight clean and you know how to fight and you stay on topic, you don't start because when you're married to someone, you know how to push their buttons. And it's so easy to one up them or one down them. Often, I'm generalizing, often men will one up and women will one down. So it's really easy to do that. And so as long as you know how to fight with each other and the fighting stays clean, that rupture will bring your relationship closer. So rupture, conflict, if there's one thing that you remember from what I say tonight, if there's one thing that I can teach you about relationships, that is that conflict is good as long as you know how to fix it. And every couple is different with the way they fix the conflict. And that is the process in the beginning. One of the things that I do, I'll just give you, so I I never imagined that this was gonna be the story of my shlichut, of my shlichus, of my being a Chabad rabbi, that I would be dealing so much with relationships. But I moved to an area that was full of students and young professionals and lots of young people. I ended up realizing that things that were innate to a lot of us years ago are not innate anymore. They all have to be learned. Everything has to be learned today. These are kids from divorced homes that have to learn how to have relationships. They have nowhere, they have no way, they have no model for a good relationship. And sometimes I would see they would come to my home because often because we have a Chabad on, on, on campus and people would come to our home a lot for Shabbat, they would actually look at us. They would be looking at my wife and I as, oh, wow, I've never seen. And they would, would say, wow, it's so nice being with your family. And then I would say, well, I want to know why. And, and it ended up would come out that it's just nice to see a healthy, a healthy family dynamic. And that's really special. I've never seen that before. And so I realized that there's so many things that are innate for some of us that are not innate for young people at all, at all, at all. And because of that, I started talking about relationships, teaching relationships, ended up being to matchmaking. And then I started having all these young couples on my hands. And so I remember that moment, it was about four years ago. And I was standing under the chuppah. It was a beautiful chuppah. It was overlooking the water. It was like these really nice flowers were hanging down from the chuppah. And I was holding that glass in my hand. And I looked up at this couple, beautiful couple, like perfect, picturesque scene. And I looked back at my cup and I looked back at the couple. And I said, I'm about to bless this union. But what did I do? What, because I'm a rabbi? I deserve to bless this union? I did nothing to set this couple up for a long lasting and healthy relationship. And I made a pledge right there at that chuppah that I will never marry a couple again without giving them tools. So now I have a whole premarital program that I do with each of the couples that I marry. And then once a month for the first year afterwards, we meet. No questions. You want, this is, this is it's non-negotiable. I don't care how religious you are. I don't care how secular you are. If you want me to preside at your wedding, there's a lot of other rabbis out there. You don't need my, 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 my Mishigas. You don't need it. But if you want me to preside at your wedding, then you got to go through my premarital program. You got to go through my once a month for the first year. It's, relationships are difficult. 
And our job as rabbis, we're the first line of defense. We have to make sure to be able to set these couples up for a long lasting and healthy relationship. We need it. They need it. The world needs it. I mean, I'll give you an example of something that's really important and just as a simple thing. So many young people today come from uh, divorced homes. And so there's three things that every kid from a divorced home has to learn. The first thing is they have to learn um, that the parents, their parents got divorced was not their fault. The second thing is they have to learn why their parents got divorced. And who do they ask to learn why their parents got divorced? Who do they ask? Not their parents, themselves, because it's their own narrative. They have to ask themselves, why did my parents get divorced and create their own narrative? And the third thing, which is the most important, is they have to learn what they're going to do differently. They have to have a clear guide and goal of what they're going to do differently. That, according to um, 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 Schnarch, the psychologist Schnarch, who unfortunately just passed away two weeks ago. So it's nice to, nice Jewish boy. His, his soul should have a, an elevation. He, he's one of the fathers of relational psychology. And um, according to these, he, he says that this will save um, 60% of relationships of children who come from divorced homes, just those three things. And those three things can take two minutes, it can take 20 minutes, it can take two hours, it can take 20 years. It depends on the person. I can talk about this all night, Rabbi. Um, question. I figure, is, I figure as long what? as we have more, than, as, as long, <laughs> we'll, let the, we'll let the audience determine it. As long as we have 15 or more, we'll stay. Okay, 15 or more, that's good. Is it possible to dissect a divorce based on the traits that you spoke about? Um, I don't know if I want to dissect divorce. Um, what I believe when it comes to past relationships is this is what you have to do with them. You have to learn from them. You have to distill them. So maybe this is the question you're asking and tell me if this is the question that you're asking. You have to distill them. You have to learn what you learn, what you learn not to do and then what you learn to do. And then what you do is the following. You take a beautiful cloth bag and you put it all in the cloth bag. You take a nice strong rope and you tie it around. And then you take a stick and you put it, the bag through the stick and you throw it over your shoulder and you keep it there behind you. But don't keep it on your forehead. Because so often we keep our past relationships on our forehead instead of over, over our shoulder. What's great about them being over our shoulder is we can just go and grab them and open them up and look inside. And every so often we need them. We need them right behind us, but not on our forehead. So yes, um, there's a way to, I guess the word you use is dissect. There's a way to dissect um, past relationships, but only for the purpose of learning what you want and don't want for a future relationship. I think that is, that's the main key. Again, we want to distill them down to their values. I mean, there's so many things that I have a, um, a number of questionnaires that I've created. I have a questionnaire that can probably help you. If you uh, message the rabbi, I'll, I'll try to send that to, to him as well. Um, if that's going to help. I have a questionnaire to help somebody understand, you know, that I was talking about that balance between uh, you know, knowing who you are and knowing what you want. I have a questionnaire for that as well that can kind of help you. Um, you know, it's really your, these are all your self-guided experiences. So it really depends on um, how much you want to work on it. Snarsh says something really amazing. He says, um, he talks about this thing called differentiation. Differentiation is the ability to be myself while in a relationship. So to be authentically myself while being in a, re in a relationship. People will marry others who are as differentiated or less differentiated than themselves. So as authentic and as true to who you are to yourself, that is going to be your level of differentiation. So I'm not saying that you should wait forever, but sometimes you want to work on yourself a little bit before you get into a relationship and that's okay. What else? You're really quiet here. You gave us a lot of stuff to think about, Rabbi. I'll, I'll let it land. It's true. I, I'm not. I'm, I'm talking, and I'm not. I'm doing exactly against what I always say. I always say you have to allow it to land, right? You have to give the space. So here I am. 
going against my own words. See, that's the conflict right there. It's not only a conflict with others, it's a conflict within ourselves. Wow, okay. Thank you, Rabbi Yisrael Bernath, for taking the time to share your wisdom with our community. We want to thank Dr. and Belinda Solomon for the sponsoring this evening's event. Turns out it was Hakar Satova, nobody knew. <laughs> and uh, next week, Saturday night, we have a very amazing special event with Cantor Chazen Schneer Zalman Baumgarten, formerly the Cantor in Moscow's main synagogue, currently a sitting member on the Council for Hasidic Music. He's actually a descendant of the Baal Hatanya, the uh, Alter Rebbe, who's released from prison. We will celebrate next Saturday night on Zoom. And you're all invited to visit the website, ChabadCLE.com. Again, thank you, Rabbi Yisrael Bernath. Thank you to the Solomons, and thank each of you for taking the time to learn with us this evening. Laila Tov, Likulam.